Hello and welcome back, or uh, to anyone new, welcome in. My name continues to be Emmanuel Clement, and today we are uh, doing another talk through of one of my recent um, practice pieces, practice projects. Um, it's a big one. It's a doozy, as you can see. It's not. It's not that long. Um, it's just tall, as you can uh, uh, as you can see here in the score. Uh, as always, I'm going to take you through each layer uh of the final composition and then put it all back together uh hopefully uh learning some interesting things about composition and orchestration along the way without further ado let's listen to uh what we're working with here Good, exciting, fun, fun, fun stuff. Um, this was, um, uh, I imagine this is sort of a um, kind of adventurous, uh, fun little chase sequence. Uh, so I've tentatively titled this bit um, uh, Escaping the Keep, uh, if you already saw that on the um, Just the Score video post. Um, it feels like there's a lot going on, probably. On first listen and i'm here to tell you as your tour guide through the piece and through um art music in general uh that there's really no more than three things going on um you know maybe three plus a special effect it's how those layers are distributed amongst the orchestral players that really gives it um that excitement we're going to delve deeper into each individual layer of this composition and like i said there are three uh, to four of them. Um, and the first step in doing that, I thought today, would be to, drumroll please, beep, switch over to uh, one of the sketch versions of this. So um, this was a project that I set out to complete in just one weekend, uh, last weekend. Uh, and I'm proud to say that I accomplished that. And when when you give yourself a, a deadline or a, a a task that seems just challenging enough one of the things that that does psychologically for me at least is it gives you permission to use every tool at your disposal to complete the task so um for this project, I decided, well, heck, you know, I can't just jump into uh, completing a full orchestral arrangement from scratch. I need to really um, uh, simplify, get the layers established and clean, and then orchestrate that. So I introduced this um, middle layer into my uh, sketch process, which is a two piano score. I've got four staves here. The top is going to be the main line. Um, which I harmonized completely in a previous step. If you want to know more about other stages of my workflow, let me know in the comments, and I maybe I will make some videos about that. I'm sort of um, establishing some some principles of workflow as I go. Um, and if you would like to know, okay, I've got a melody. How do I go about harmonizing this in a clear way? Um, I can tell you about that. Anyway, the main sound is up here in the top. And then just under that is going to be the bass line. And I consider this uh, piano one sort of the, the more important layers. Um, and then down here, we've got middle and background layers, not as important as the top two staves. Um, uh, you'll notice they're all marked a dynamic lower uh, for that reason. Uh, we've got um, uh, a harmony rhythm layer here and then a little filigree layer on top. Um, so let's listen to this again very quickly. It's only... 20 seconds so uh we won't lose a lot of time we'll listen to this two piano version again and see if you can hear um individually the uh, melodic line the bass line and the harmonic layer as their own parts Um, 
um, hopefully something was a little clearer to you on a second listen and on a, um, a homogenized listen, right? There aren't all the uh, quite literal bells and whistles of the orchestra getting in the way of hearing um, what each layer is doing um, clearly. I don't want to spend too much time on um, how these layers are designed to interlock um, but it may be useful to touch on that a little bit before we go into um, the orchestration zone, so to speak. Um, one thing that I want to point out briefly is um, for all three of these layers, melody, harmony, bass, um, I'm thinking about what rhythmically the main line is doing and then uh, filling in some of the available gaps, available space with um, rhythmic material in the other layers. So you notice here, um, right away, our main idea, it has this little break in it right here, and what better space for our bass line to occupy, right? Um, it can go and then, um, not only fill in this available space, but it happens to be on the pulse of our meter. So we have a part that is helping us keep time uh, as well as filling in the space. And when you when you fill in the rhythmic space like this, you know, I used to think that maybe um, the whole thing would get kind of kind of cluttered um, rhythmically. Uh, but really the effect is more of a you really get a sense of rhythmic back and forth between sections that is actually kind of exciting. So um, don't be afraid to have um, uh, lots of beats in your bar filled up with activity, um, as long as it's uh, uh, that activity is sort of distributed in an interesting way across a variety of la layers. Um, uh, and then here, uh, the harmony line is accenting the downbeat of the bar. Um, and then it's also accenting the beat that the melody returns, right? So uh, together, let's just do these friends. Um, and then I decided in a little bit of a two-bar pattern um, to flip it, to do the reverse. So you see in each bar we have um, beat one, beat two, and the end of two. Uh, and here we have beat one, beat two in the harmony layer instead, and the end of two in the bass. So the groove is the same, but the bass and harmony layers have traded off which one is hitting which um, every two bars, and that makes it a kind of a fun groovy structure. Let's actually listen to just these, if we may. Oh. Maybe we can't. I think I experimented with this earlier. Um, and it's like, no, those are both pianos. You have to hear the pianos. Yeah. Um, well, that's a good, as good an excuse as any to move back to the uh, full orchestra. Uh, and we can explore that relationship in the whoop, full arrangement. Okay, now... Um, Usually I like to go through the layers in order, and I was up early this morning preparing um, filters for us to explore each layer in order from an orchestrational perspective. Um, so we're going to start with the main idea, the main sound, how that um, develops over the course of this little segment, and then we're going to move through the other layers appropriately and you know, talk about um, whatever comes up. Uh, so let's begin. There we go. Isn't this, see, isn't this a lot less information <laughs> to deal with? Um, our main sound um, that is continuous, actually, from beginning to end, um, with other things added to it, is just going to be a flute and oboe sound. Let's hear this by itself for a few bars.
don't worry about that little gap. We'll talk about that later. And you might have noticed that sectionally we have, um, uh, you know, this idea, uh, this idea here is repeated verbatim um, here, uh, just in a new key um, for a second. I don't want to talk too much about the compositional structure because this is more of an orchestration talk through. But again, if you're interested, Tell me in the comments below. Maybe I'll try and uh, do something like that in the future. Um, not a lot to say here. Um, the I wanted oboe for this line because I wanted it to have a little bit of uh, punch uh, throughout. The oboe has a nice crisp attack. Um, and uh, the flute helps uh, round out that crispness, right? So the, the oboe can... <laughs> it sometimes has a reputation of um, uh, don't tell them this, but honking. Um, I don't think of it that way, but it is true that the reed timbre um, has a particular dryness to it that the wetter quality of the flute timbre is going to round out. And so um, uh, as a compound timbre, these complement each other. Um, it gets more interesting as we see some of the rest of the wind players who have our main line. I'm going to stay zoomed in, actually. We want you to be able to see this a little more closely. So um, as our melodic line progresses through the piece, it gains power, right? There's an ensemble crescendo up to the double bar here where I've got the wind players um, playing fortissimo up uh, this bottom bassoon is forte you know i'm actually not sure what that's forte maybe that should be fortissimo maybe it should be forte just because bassoons are allowed um it's probably forte to match its friend bassoon two who is doing something different um but we'll talk about that later so uh think, think of this you know ensemble crescendo being achieved um, literally by adding instruments, by adding players, as well as having them swell into um, the phrase. So here we've got just uh, our flute to oboe one. Flute one is doing the little descant thing that um, you might have heard in the piano sketch. Um, clarinet is added for uh, crescendo, but it's also for thickness, right? If you hear this, it's a little bit of a um, uh, counter line. Um, not counterline, excuse me, but, but thickness, um, uh, the winds as a unit are playing this main sound idea. And even though these are different, uh, tones, um, the clarinet is moving with them in lockstep rhythm. And we're going to hear the higher note as the, um, the main intended note of that little block. Uh, let's listen to them get bigger and bigger as we approach the double bar. And now by the time we get here, we're actually in a full, um, uh, little chorus, little quartet structure. We've got low D, F. A, and then high D on top. Um, so in addition to um, uh, more players being added, the music itself is actually expanding in thickness as well, right? We have a unison line here, and then a little duet. Um, shrinks down briefly to uh, octaves, so we have kind of a we expand and then a slight contraction and then we grow again adding notes as well as players here we have the d and the c together here we have the uh uh the b flat uh d c sharp uh here is where we get to the four full of four notes of um of the chord and then we're at four notes uh here um, the bassoon entrance here is doubling a bass, um, part. So, um, don't worry about these three, but they are a helpful lead into, uh, 
this peer. And then guess what? I lied. There's actually one more because the strings enter for the second section. So um, structurally, I wanted a little bit of um, not a little bit. I wanted to contrast uh, between the first statement and the second statement, um, timbrally, ensemble. So in addition to the ensemble being um, the ensemble playing the main line, getting stronger and stronger in multiple ways throughout uh, the A section here. Um, we also have, after we hit this double bar, a whole new timbre added to the main sound. So what, what was winds then became, excuse me, stronger and stronger winds, and then finally winds plus strings. Let's listen to that transition because um, I think it's a really nice. And then uh, they retain that compound timbre winds plus strings on the main line going into the end. So I like to think of it as, because um, um, this is repeating the original material in the original key of uh, C minor, uh, we've come back home, but we've retained some of the transformation that we went on along the way. Um, and that, that's what helps this feel final. Um, uh, despite being so short. Oh boy, I'm talking a mile a minute, I feel like. Is there anything else interesting to talk about? Well, uh, you know, you might have noticed that this uh, short little piece involves a lot of repeated notes, and um, uh, that's not my usual style, um, but uh, I actually belong to uh, a course website called Score Club, uh, which I highly recommend. Um, their challenge for April uh, on that site was a repeated note challenge, right? So to to write something that uses way more than you would ever intend to. Um, this was actually a, a sort of a daily practice page for me, but I remembered about that and I decided to lean into the repeated notes. And I'm so tickled by this, but um, uh, Let's count how many Ds we have in a row here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen Ds in a row. Uh, and I'm so pleased with how structurally um, I was able to disguise that that repetition is is happening um, in a way. One thing is to is that the rhythm is helping keep things interesting, but um, between the interesting rhythm of the motive itself, the meter change here, and then this structural key change, right? It's felt as like ah, we're starting a new unit, even though we still have um, five <laughs> D notes in a row to go. It really doesn't sound like it's hammering on that one note, um, and I was tickled pink uh, to be able to um, pull that off. Hopefully um, you hear it that way. Um, it helps build a lot of excitement and tension going into that key change because we want it to, uh, we're like, we want it to do something like, oh, okay, where's this going to go? Um, and uh, it really, uh, um, helps things bound off, I think. Okay, um, let's look next at the baseline. Um, for, so the, so I've orchestrated this layer, um, using similar skills and techniques as I have the top layer, the mainline layer, right? I'm thinking about what our main sound is throughout and how to shape it with um, thickening or adding other uh, members of the ensemble as desired. Um, so our main sound throughout is going to be the low strings, mostly in unison. Um, and what I like about how this turned out is um, uh, got this nice, very low, gritty open string on the cello. Um, 
unison with you know, a, a fairly comfortable um, version on the um, contrabasses. And um, um, I just like how that low note um, turns out this way. Uh, we're in octaves here. And then the how this bass line is shaped. Um, so you remember in the piano sketch, it's just um, the high and then the low octave. Uh, I've shaped it here so that uh, the cello and contrabass are in octaves here, and then unison on the lower one. So I, the the intended effect is um, that you hear that high to low sound of the the um, higher C and then the lower C, but also um, uh, that that lower one has a little uh, a different kind of weight to it. Um, let's listen to just a few bars of this. Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice sound. Um, I'm used to, uh, putting the cellos and contrabasses, um, in octaves. Yeah, they're yeah they're in octaves. Um, uh, it's a really nice sound, but um, uh, these unisons um, that they get into are really really choice. Um, so don't be afraid to use those. Uh, we've got some unisons in here as well. Uh, yeah, all of this is unison. The little descending, and then it returns. It returns suddenly to the octave. So that's another way that I've shaped this line is um, when the ensemble as a whole and this uh, layer needs to get uh, a bit quieter, we have them in unison instead of in octaves um, in addition to the lowered dynamic. And then this subito forte, they also suddenly expand back into their um, octave structure. So little things like that. Um, uh, We've talked previously in these videos about redundancy, right? Um, not in a negative way, but reinforcing the same desired idea, the same desired gesture, emotion, structure um, on multiple levels. So uh, they all enhance each other, they all reinforce each other. And, um, uh, you know, if someone doesn't really hear the harmony is giving them that effect, maybe they'll hear the rhythm is giving them that effect. Maybe they'll hear the instrumentation is giving them that effect. Maybe they'll hear the dynamic is giving them that effect. Um, you get the idea. So it, rather than being um, heavy handed uh, with, um, uh, you might think like, okay, like, do we really have to hammer home this downbeat? with the harmony and the orchestration and the song structure and the instrumentation and everything, um, uh, it really does help. It really does help um, your listener who will probably only listen once. Maybe they'll only have the opportunity to hear this once all the way through. Um, making your work robustly comprehensible um, to to a new listener, to, to really invite any listener on board um, using all the tools at your disposal is useful, is, is a good thing to do. Because at the end of the day, we want to give people something. We're going to give people experience, maybe as many people as possible. Um, and uh, um, this is a way that you can help make sure that what you're going for, or um, uh, the most important parts of what you're going for, uh, land with as many potential listeners as possible. So don't be afraid to um, really sell something on multiple layers. Um, I think of it as um, um, adding richness as well. Um, like if whatever, whatever feeling that we're going for at this downbeat of 19, um, it's enriched by going for it in the dynamic layer. It's enriched by going for it in um, orchestrational technique. It's enriched um, uh, in all these different ways. Uh, so don't uh, don't be afraid to um, uh, really go hard on um, the, 
the ideas, the core ideas of your work, um, rather than saying, okay, how many ideas can I fit in? Um, that's a trap. Not, not everyone's going to hear 50 different ideas happening at once. If you manage to fit them all in there and none of them are going to be as strong because you have to split them up across all these different instruments and players. Um, so balance that out. Think about that in your own work. Uh, we haven't listened to any music for a little while. We need to listen to some more. So, uh, we've got the enriched baseline here do i have a even further image no um so like i said the low strings handled it for most of it and then i've brought in the uh trombones and bassoon too um so let's listen to the whole baseline ensemble actually from like here Um, don't worry about this last bar in the trombones. We'll talk about that in a bit. That's the brass section as a whole changing roles for a second. Um, so that's why the trombones are splitting away from the bass part there. Um, not much to talk about. Um, look at this layered entrance, right? Um, it would be... Let me delete this briefly. And Oops. Don't want to delete the time change. Don't want to delete the time change. So without the trombones, uh, leading up to this, listen to how much more sudden this is. And maybe that's warranted um, sometimes, but I like to uh, sneak them into the ensemble. Um, So uh, here I've introduced one trombone as a little bit of a resonance layer over the top um, at a dynamic quiet enough that um, you probably won't hear them enter in the, uh, in the final. Um, uh, same here. Uh, you remember that um, um, that upper bassoon had this little line as well. And then here for a second, notice how the trombones are not doing the full octave jump. Um, for a couple reasons. One, um, I thought it might be a little unwieldy um, for them. I may be mistaken in that. But also, uh, uh, thinking about en enriching, right? Enriching the character. We've heard this octave jump idea in the strings a few times now. Um, and we could hear the um, trombones added and it would be perfectly exciting. But we've added another uh, layer to the sound, which you probably heard, which is they're holding on to the upper um, D, so it's um, uh, it's resonating uh, a little longer than uh, you hear it over here. So here it's quite um, here it's quite clipped. Which I wanted. Um, and then here it's like that first that upper note is so strong that it echoes for longer, um, and the trombones are providing that echo. So listen to the difference between that and this. Otherwise, they blend into the rest of the ensemble playing the bass notes um, quite nicely. Um, so fun little trick there. What else do we have to talk about in the bass line? Um, we talked about this stack. We might not have talked about this specific um, staggered rhythm. Let me switch back to the piano score quickly to demonstrate that um, they're just uh, uh, alternating. Um, they're doing their little trade off thing rhythmically again, the bass line and the harmony line. Um, so cha cha cha, and then alternating zigzagging here to choo, and then here the harmony line has the downbeats and the bass has the offbeats. Da, 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 da. 
adds a little excitement um, to the to the baseline, which is always uh, nice. But that's why um, that rhythm in the baseline you're looking at here um, might seem a little strange. Like, what, oh, what are they doing there? Well, it's because they're interlocking with another layer that we're not seeing in this filter. Hmm. Okay, I think that's enough for the bases. Um, talking about the harmony line, harmony layer briefly. Um, it's just chords throughout in the horns. I'll skip straight to the next uh, filter. So um, just like with the um, wind main line, getting the strings added, going into the um, key change, uh, the harmony layer starts as just the four horns and then has the strings added to it. Uh, we've got um, violin twos and violas um, to VZ on these chords. Um, let's just listen to them do this. Uh, same technique here of sneaking the strings in early going into the double bar. Um, another thing uh, that I that comes to mind about that we talked in a previous talk through video about um, widening the impact of a structurally important event. So um, uh, having the strings and the trombones enter this early predicting this beat here when they're really active um, makes that downbeat broader in time and gives it more weight and impact as a result. So think about that in your own writing. Um, let's listen to this. Oops. I said, let's listen to this. Okay, we're back. Uh, I had to close and restart uh, Dorico there. Technology happens, as they say. Nobody says that. Uh, so we were about to, I believe, listen to uh, this little transition uh, from the horn harmony into the horn plus strings harmony. Very nice. And then um, here the strings split off because they're adding a little bit of thickness to the, the main line there. Um, one thing you might remember is that in the piano version, uh, the harmony line was uh, a three note uh, chord, and I've split it across four horns. Uh, what up with that? Uh, I've simply doubled um, the top line at the octave to make it a quartet. And the horns stay as a quartet throughout, except uh, for one key point here. You notice here, horn one and two is doubled with horn three and four. Um, we might as well go ahead and talk about that right away. There is a reason for that. There ought to be a reason for, for everything in your composition. If you point to something and you can't really uh, decide what it's doing musically, that's a sign that maybe it shouldn't be there or it should be doing something else. Um, but yes, I can tell you with confidence uh, why uh, this is written this way. It's for balance among the brass section. Um, so let's filter to the full brass here. We've got four horns on top, uh, then two trumpets, and then two trombones. Um, you might ask yourself, aren't the horns lower than the trumpets? Why are they on top? Tradition, really. Um, that's the that's most of it. So uh, the the key detail here behind this decision it has to do with just the content of the last two bars. Um, uh, here I've decided that the brass section is is uniting into a big um, uh, big set of chords with the melody line on top. Um, and one rule of thumb uh, that you'll read in the Rimsky-Korsakov text, um, and many people will probably repeat to you, is that uh, 
roughly speaking, horns, um, you need two horns to equal the loudness of a single trumpet or a trombone. Um, you know, think, oh, that, that's, that sounds so strange, but um, thinking about it for a moment, you know, they're pointing, the, the horn bell is actually pointing away uh, from the audience, um, as well as the instrument itself having a bit mellower tone, um, and uh, as opposed to the really brash, um, uh, bright attack of the others. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, if you want a well-balanced uh, brass chord, um, you might need uh, two horns for every uh, single trumpet or trombone you have. And that's exactly what I've got going on here. So uh, it's written as a five-note chord, G, B, E flat, F, B flat. It's a nasty chord. Um, you jazz heads are going to enjoy that one. Um, and uh, so I've split uh, the notes as follows. A single trombone on the lowest. Uh, then we have... Um, uh, well, we have this lower um, trombone, but this is doing a bass line thing. Um, a single trombone on the G. Two horns on the B to equal the balance of that trombone. Two horns on the E flat to equal the balance of the other instruments. Um, a single trumpet on the F. A single trumpet on the B flat. Let's listen briefly to the difference between um, uh, uh, if we had one per part and um, the horns on their proper uh, two per part. Let's listen from here. So one horn, one horn, and the rest. very top heavy. Let's listen again. Now adding our horns in pairs, you really hear the correct fullness of the harmony. Uh, so keep that in mind in future as you uh, voice your big brass chords. Um, and heck, let's listen to it from the whole brass section from this bar because it's fun. Nice. Okay, uh, we've taken a lot of time already. Uh, so the last thing I want to do is talk about the percussion. Uh, now, one thing about Dorico is I'm using a, a sort of a semi-pro version that it, um, uh, has a high limit, but a limit on the number of players. Um, and so uh, if I given unlimited players, I might have added more percussion for color and excitement. Um, as it is, I could only fit in um, these three, and that's fine because it forced me to um, use them efficiently to accent structurally the most important uh, elements. Um, that's the role here. I've uh, included the uh, contrabass and the one of the horns in order to demonstrate sort of who the percussion is lining up with at any given time. Um, so you see here the timpani and bass drum are supporting that octave bass line uh, gesture by having both of them strike on the downbeat and then just the bass drum on the second beat. So you, you'll hear ensemble this kind of uh, <laughs> Um, which reinforces the uh, octave idea in the same way that um, the, the cellos and contrabasses right are then octave and then um, the lower tone. Um, okay, here the timpani is briefly helping out with the harmony line. Um, here on the downbeat, not a lot to talk about. Um, here and here, we're doing this thing again where I'm broadening the um, inevitable attack of this downbeat by having the roll start in the previous bar um, and then uh, layering it in time a little bit so the timpani is starting to roll on beat two here and then the bass drum on this uh, quick one at the end. Um, uh, still broader in time than just 
the downbeat, but um, uh, uh, but it, um, sooner. I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> I don't know what I was saying there. Okay, uh, tempity has changed to uh, hitting the octave here, uh, doing a little more excitement before each accented beat. Um, the crash symbol uh, only used twice. Uh, because uh, we don't want to overuse it and let the audience get too used to this timbre. Um, here at the climactic uh, bar, and then here at the end to say, yep, we're done. Um, that should about do it, but I think um, uh, listening, your ears are, are one of your best teachers, so let's give a listen to the percussion along with these layers, and I think you'll uh, understand what I'm saying about using them to support the existing layers. So the percussion is is supporting these other layers and helping accentuate the big structural points in the form for the listener. Uh, they're not doing their own independent layer of stuff, um, and that's an important thing to um, uh, to get across. Boy, we've talked about a lot today, huh? Um, and uh, let's simply call it a day and take all of this knowledge that I've <laughs> blasted at you into a final listen of the whole ding dang thing. Uh, hopefully you'll notice even more than before on this final listen. Um, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you like what I'm doing here today, don't hesitate to use the button that uh, tells me so uh, and tells uh, YouTube. Uh, that you liked what I do here. And um, I will, I was absent for a little while, but I do want to try to be uh, uploading things on a weekly basis at the very least. So you might uh, see a lot more of me in the near future. Um, all that is to say, have a fantastic rest of your day and uh, let's go ahead and play ourselves out. Nice. Uh, happy listening, everybody. See you next time.